Anything Cricket Let's Talk is brought to you by Rascals Barbados, My Kind of Beauty, and the Calvary Institute. Studios of the Caribbean Media Corporation, Bridgetown Barbados. Today I'll be joined by Wayne Holden and Martin Paris. Our special guest is Roland Butcher, the former international cricketer and current cricket administrator. When we come back, Martin Paris will chat with Roland Butcher and Wayne Holden. Well, I guess I'm the self-appointed Anything Cricket Let's Talk Ambassador, because here I am again, welcoming our guest this time, Roland Butcher. Nice to have you on Anything Cricket Let's Talk. Martin, it's a great pleasure to be here. Speaking of being here, you haven't been here in the island for a bit. I understand you've just returned from some ICC Associates America's business? Yes, absolutely. I was um, in Canada with the Argentine side, taking part in the ICC on the 19 World Cup qualifiers. Next year, the World Cup is in South Africa, and obviously the region had the qualifiers, so that was quite a good time. And what exactly did you do while you were in Canada? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, as far as Argentina is concerned, I am a consultant, also an advisor at the Argentine Cricket Association, so... They wanted me to go along with the team, uh, with the coach and the manager, and just really observe and, and make recommendations, etc., etc. Oh, and before we forget, on behalf of everyone here at Anything Cricket, let's talk. Congratulations on adding the ICC World Cup title to your 2020 title. Yes, um, obviously the ICC tournament this year was good at times and as you know there was interrupted by rain but I think at the end of the day I thought England deserved to win it um, they had a hiccup in the middle but came right at the end with some good performances in, in three matches which really guaranteed them um, obviously the way they won it was a bit contentious but at the end of the day um, I think they'll take it after 40 odd years not winning it they'll be highly delighted um, could I take it to mean then that New Zealand deserved to not to win it? Um, no, I think New Zealand played their part in what was a, a, a terrific game I don't think we will see the likes again of um, a cricket match like that where it's tied after the initial 50 overs and then after the super over um, I think as a neutral you would believe that no team deserved to lose but as you know in cricket uh, somebody has to be a winner and the rules said that it had to be a winner and it just was unfortunate that it turned out that way but I think England at the end of the day things went really well for them all the little one percenters for their part and certainly in, in the last part of the innings and the super, super fit over as well so we can actually conclude that New Zealand didn't lose the match they didn't lose the final so England didn't win the, the, the World Cup, they were awarded the World Cup. Well, you say that, um, they lifted it, so I, I, I guess you only lift the World Cup when you win it. Um, when you're awarded <laughs> something. <laughs> but, um, you know, those are the rules. Whether the rules are right or wrong, um, perhaps they need to change them, who knows. But you have to play with whether every team knew exactly what they were under. And maybe some teams didn't know. That, that may be the truth. That yes, they, didn't, they didn't scrutinize it that, that deeply. But at the end of the day, it probably wasn't a satisfactory way to finish, but um, I think England will be quite happy. I was just being the devil's advocate. I know that. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the rules were there from the outset, and uh, we can't change the goalposts or move the goalposts in the middle of the, uh, well, at the end of the competition. So, as I said, just being devil's advocate. Speaking of goalposts, what a nice way to segue into Roland and his several hats that he wears. Did you know that he used to be one of the gaffers at the Reading Soccer Club in England, 
He's also an administrator of sport at the University of the West Indies. And I understand you were another title with the Cricket West Indies Rowing? Uh, I'm not sure where to start, Martin. Um, I'll start with the, with the West Indies. I, I am on pre retirement leave now, so really it is time for me to pass the baton on to someone else. Um, West Indies, yes, I'm on the Cricket Committee. I was on the last Cricket Committee as well, so this is just a re election onto that committee. Um, so there's a number of areas that I've been involved with in administration of the sport since I retired from the game, and um, I spent 15 years at the university. You wear many, many hats, Roland, but uh, of course we know that you have recently been appointed as a selector with the Barbados Senior National Team, the, the Barbados Pride uh, franchise, and uh, congratulations on that. Well, thank you, and uh, I think wearing all those hats is why I haven't got much hair on my head now. Well, yes, uh, well you need it. <laughs> Um, not, you need not worry about that part because <laughs> it's not what's on your head, it is what is in your head mm -hmm. that I think that we in the cricket fraternity will be interested in. And uh, so far, so good. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've enjoyed the short stint as, as a selector. Um, obviously, throughout your career, um, selection is something that you get involved with, even if you're not a selector. Um, every, Bar every Barbadian who loves cricket is a selector, I'm sure. They pick teams constantly um, and even when you pick your teams they tell you that the team you pick is not the right one that their team is the right one but yeah it's been a short while but I've enjoyed it and um, you know we hope obviously by the end of this year that we've picked the right teams for Barbados to ensure that they win all the competitions that they take part in. Well of course the selectors uh, the selection of the team is only one aspect of, of, of that, that, that winning combination and um, it's going to take a much more than just uh, the naming of the whatever number of players uh, you may want to. But in the meantime, your work, though, has just barely begun. Uh, what, what, what does it entail, though, uh, from, from here on in? We know of the 49 players uh, who have been invited to, to, to get themselves uh, in preparedness uh, for the upcoming uh, professional regional season. But I'm sure that there is a lot more to be done uh, uh, as a selector. It certainly is. I think initially the selection of the squad, to, the provisional squad, which was just to train. Um, really what West Indies cricket, well it's no cricket West Indies, what they have done and said going forward is that even the first class players have to be at the same level of fitness as the test players. So it means that you have to start with um, 40 on the yo-yo test. So it, it makes no sense if you don't bring the guys in early. Um, get them working, get them tested. If there is a deficiency, then they have something to work towards. So, you know, that was the reason, the reason for getting so many people together. The other reason was that at that moment in time, um, you weren't sure what was going to happen in terms of West Indies in relation to their winter program. Um, so you had to get people involved so that if the test team is aware, um, you've got backup players. Now, there was a point where they said all the players were going to be available. The test players were going to be available, which was great. But then, Martin, I'm sure that you would know that in the last week, um, this announcement has come out now where in November, West Indies will be playing Afghanistan in India. And as soon as that series finish, they've got a, a, a white ball series against India in India, which is going to take them out to the end of December. So it, it literally wipes out all the Barbadian test players who, were, who will be on that tour from playing in you know, a 50 over competition. So all those other boys now will get an opportunity um, to play. Right, and then the other hat. Chairman of the Saraton Week Center of Excellence Committee. Um, I think you've enjoyed some rather um, enjoyable time um, with the successes that have come um, with a number of the teams involved in, in, in that program. Could you tell us a bit more? Yeah, well, as you know, the Centre of Excellence um, is the major uh, player development program that the BCA has. Um, I have been chairman now for many years, and um, you know we've had a good deal of success, and obviously there's still a lot more work to be done. Um, uh, I think particularly if you think what has happened in the last few years in relation to the under-15s, where they've won back-to-back -to -back tournaments. Um, 
regional tournaments. The only seven teams have won back-to-back -back regional tournaments. Um, this year, we've only got the on the 19s left. The women won both trophies this year, both 50 over and T20. So, obviously, the whole aim of the Centre of Excellence is to produce top-line cricketers for Barbados and obviously for the West Indies. And at the same time, you know, winning is also very important. So, to prepare teams that will win. Uh, major tournaments um, in the region. So that's what we're all about. Um, we've got a very good um, coaching staff at the BCA that works in the Centre of Excellence, um, currently led by, by Dexter Topping, who is the acting um, head coach, while Henderson Springer is on West Indies duty. So, you know, he's leading the team of, of very good coaches. The guys work very hard, and there's no surprise that they've been successful because, you know, first of all, you have to, you have to identify good talent and then put them in a program that's going to help them to develop as players. I understand that's a component of the legacy element of the 2007 ICC Cricket World Cup held at Kensington over the center of excellence. What has happened that we developed several age group youth players, we had an academy in Grenada, the high performance center here in Barbados, and then poof, there was this huge void in the transition from that level onwards to full-fledged West Indies representation? Well, that transition has been there, um, or lack of, for a long time. I mean, it's, it's no new thing. It's something that um, I have certainly identified over a period of time. I have discussed it at uh, Cricket West Indies level. And for me, the, the, the real problem is that after under 19, you have a vacuum. Um, there's a regional tournament at 15, 17, 19. And at that point in time, there's no further tournaments for those players to, to take part in. Those players are then expected to play in the regional first-class sides, which is an unfair expectation. So a small region like the Caribbean, I don't think we can afford to t throw away 120 um, under-19 players every year. So what, what's needed is an is a under-23 tournament, regional under-23 tournament, to keep those players in the system because we cannot afford to lose so many players. From under 15, you've been, you've been giving them a great grounding, you've teach them how to train, how to eat, how to behave, etc., etc. And just at the time when they need it most, you're gonna send them out to clubs that perhaps don't have the same um, sort of um, ability to, to move them forward. So we here in Barbados have recognized that as well. We now have a it's an A team, which is virtually on the 23 team, but it's an A team, um, recognizing that those are the players that you've got to develop from um, 19 um, till they get into the first side. So we've got a lot of work to do here in Barbados and in the region. Okay, well, <clears throat> I don't know if it's going to be an off break or a leg break, but we're going to take a break here. On anything cricket, let's talk. Rascals Barbados. Let us serve you in a relaxed atmosphere with complimentary Wi-Fi or try a takeout meal. Rascals on the Mighty Griner Highway. Call 538-9990. Healing, nourishing, restoring. Amazing products essential to provide healthy skin. My kind of beauty. Let it be yours. For expert tuition, call the Calvary Institute. We offer classes at primary and secondary level. Our adult programs include floral arranging, jewelry making, crochet, knitting, sewing, photography, conversational Spanish, and more. Check out our summer special in video editing. Phone 232-2109. The Calvary Institute. Our guest is Roland Butcher, and we're about to put him in the nets and give him some gentle throwdowns. Roland, developmental, youth level, and in particular, the under-17 team. Yes, Martin, the under-17 team, as you know, is part of the Centre of Excellence, and 
They had an excellent year again this year. They won the under 17 tournament. That's a back to back tournament because they won it last year as well. Um, you know, again, Dexter Topping is the coach of that team, um, along here with Neymar Win. And um, they've been very successful, good young players. And, you know, I expect going forward, certainly next year, that those boys will move up to under 19s and do the same thing that they've done this year. Winning tournaments, not necessarily the be all and end all of. Um, your objectives yeah. at the Center of Excellence because we have got to take into context the level of the competition in which you're at. I mean, Barbados has that program in place. And f from your knowledge, though, is there anything um, that can compare to what we have here with, with our youth development among the, 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 other, re the other islands in the region? That's a good question, Wayne. Um, Basically, around the region, as you know, they're, they don't have the same sort of resources that we have here in Barbados. Um, we're extremely fortunate that uh, we have lottery support, which enables us to do a lot more than the other nations. Um, I think perhaps Trinidad is perhaps the only one in terms of, uh, of finance who, who, who can get the same sort of programs together. But I always believe that it's not just always finance that um, creates a good program. Because if you look at what's happened to Guyana over the last five years and the success that they have had at all levels, um, you will see that they have done that with little finance and they have been extremely um, successful. I think the challenge for us here in Barbados is that, you know, we are producing good players, players who are good enough to get into the West Indies side, etc., etc. But the challenge really is to produce the type of players that are not just going to get into the West Indies side, but are going to be star players um, on the world circuit. Um, it's okay getting into the West Indies side, but for the sake of just getting in and performing at the same level as the guys there, that is not what we're about. I think we need to produce players now that can perform in the West Indies side like all the other teams do at the top level and be, and be top class players. So what you're actually saying is that the West Indies production line has got to be able to put a player out there, uh, let's say coming out of all of our programs, who is ready and world class. Of course, I mean, that has to be, you can't just be satisfied with getting in, in, into the West Indies side. Um, you know, if, if he's getting in there and making the same 20, 30, 40 as anyone else, that is no good. We have to get players that get in there that score hundreds so that the rest of the world can actually look and say, you know, these guys are really good players. Um, so you can get carried away by winning all the time because all that is relative against the competition that you have. So we've got, we have to keep pushing the boundaries and make sure that we are pushing these players certainly beyond their capabilities. So clearly we are saying that that is not happening at present. No, it's not. I mean, I say the reason for that is that, you know, we are fairly limited here also at Kensington Oval in terms of, of facilities. Um, while Kensington Oval is a fantastic uh, mecca of cricket, etc., etc., in terms of practice facilities, um, it's still fairly limited. We only have a certain number of nets which is used by you know all and sundry you've got all the different age groups 13 15 17 19s under 23 women franchise touring teams everybody so they're not the best and obviously the absence of an indoor cricket school is something that is is desperately needed so if we want to have a world-class um, center of excellence you know we, we have to ensure that we get those things and then put the technology in place as well to move the players um, to the next level. Otherwise, we will just produce players who are good enough to play um, at our level, but uh, when they get to the, the top level, they will struggle. But you actually preempted my next question by mentioning technology because that is uh, what are the plans, though, for, for the improvement of, of the use uh, of the technological aids um, towards uh, in, within the, the, the center and within Barbados cricket generally? Well, those are um, very important things to and tools to have. I mean, something that I have been chasing for some time now within the BCA is um, Pitch Vision and, and Tima, which are two very good tools for developing and tracking your players. So that's the sort of thing that we will need, but until we get the indoor school, uh, we will not be able to get the real technology of the Hawkeye, etc., etc. So right now, I think we need to get those type of things. And something that is very common these days all around the world and every sport really is um, you know the, the, the GPS catalyst for, for training I mean those are 
so, so important now, and, and, and everybody uses them because... Stick a pin, that kind of rhinoceros hump thing in the back of a player's shirt, which is actually a tracker for their motion and stuff on the field of play. That's correct. It's a GPS um, um, system, and you know that tracks everything, how, how far you run, you're quick. When, when you finish, you just plug it into the, into, into the computer, and everything is there for you. So you can, you can plan your training sessions, you can plan your resting periods, everything is there. That's the sort of technology we have to get to in, in the future, Wayne. We're nowhere near there yet. Um, you know, it's quite a costly um, technology. But as you know, Martin, um, when you watch any sport, just have a look at the back of the player's neck in the shirt, and you will see this, this bulge, uh, and that's what it is. Even the women involved in the Ashes series uh, currently on in England, uh, it has been quite noticeable that, to use Martin's description, hippopotamus-like gadget. Yeah, it, it, it is, and, and, and that, that's how it is, and that is the future. You can't rely purely on you know, watching a guy bat with the pure eyes. I mean, too often we are still um, playing the game when it's come purely to talent. And talent will only take you so far. You have to use all the technology and everything else to ensure that you go to the top level. You know, if you, if you look at the England side, some people may not like the England side, but if you take the players one for one and you see the level that those guys are at in terms of of their fitness, in terms of their shot selection, in terms of their power and everything else. That's all been carefully planned, but it's been carefully planned with the technology as well. You see why you have made it to the very top as a first class cricketer and also as an international cricketer because again, you predicted the next ball I was going mm. to bowl mm. <laughs> because I was going to ask about the fitness levels. Uh, even here now, let's get back locally and uh, the, the disparity that, we, that is obvious between the average first-class cricketer here in the Caribbean and what we see at the international level, especially among the quote-unquote big teams, the Englands, the Indias, the Australians, the likes, and yeah, the New Zealands. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we are still a long way um, behind the rest of the world in terms of um, fitness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what I will say is that um, Barbados is the fittest team in this region. Um, because, as you know, they get tested. Um, they have to do, as I said, at least 40 on the yo-yo test. So Barbados is um, by far and above um, the strongest in terms of fitness. Uh, what I would say also is that this current group of players that we've had training, um, of all those players that we've had, um, um, there's only about four players who fell below the 40. But what happens now is that they have, they're given a period of time um, to get up to the 40. So out of all that group, I would say that, you know, Barbados is way ahead at the moment. So it's basically performance and at a consistent level. Yes, yes. I mean, and, and you have to maintain um, that fitness right th throughout the season. Um, there's no point in getting fit to a point when you start playing, uh, you then lose it for the rest of the season. And as you know, um, the season will start with the 50 over competition in November and it won't finish till the end of April. So it's a very long time and obviously the players have got to be fit. The other thing I will add is that the West Indies, uh, Great West Indies now are going to introduce the fact that contracted players, if they don't meet um, that level, they will initially lose 25% um, of their salary and um, any further ones, there will be further um, losses as well. So there's an incentive there really for players to make sure that they get up to the level that is required. If to backtrack slightly, uh, Roland, you did mention earlier in the interview uh, about being on pre-retirement leave. One, one <laughs> takes that to mean that you're getting ready to leave the University of the West Indies and your capacity there. Well, uh, effectively, I have left because I, I have been on leave since about um, middle of June um, in terms of the amount of holiday that I've got left. I officially finished the end of July, um, which is just over a week, really. Um, but, you know, I spent 15 years at university, um, it's been 15 good years, I think I've worked really hard while I've been there in those 15 years and achieved um, a tremendous amount. So you have been somewhat of a pioneer in that program. Are you satisfied now, that, uh, as you move on, that you have achieved um, the, the objectives and, and the targets that 
would have been set for you when, when you first went into the job. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I, I was brought to university in 2004. Um, obviously, all, you, all of you here would know that um, during that time at the university, we, ne we never really had a sports program in any shape or form. Um, you know, they played sport, but um, it was not to a certain level. So I came with a very clear mandate, which was to professionalize and the game, improve the facilities and, you know, ensure that players that come to university uh, with the ability to play a sport and academics, they could do both. So I think over 15 years I have done that. Um, we, first, we started with cricket, that was the first thing. Uh, we got them into the BCA competition. Um, they've done fairly well in that competition over the years. Um, then into the West Indies regional competition. Then we did all the same thing with the other sports. At the same time, we've improved the facilities in terms of, um, as you know, we had a very small cricket pavilion. The World Cup came along and that afforded us the opportunity to get what we have now. Um, improvements on the field. Then the UCM Boat Sports Complex with the football, new football field and et cetera, et cetera. So I would think over the period of time, the 15 years that um, I have been involved in a, a revolution at the university and I'm very proud of that. And what would you consider to be some of your major achievements? Well, my major achievements is obviously, um, having done all that, is to see that the teams excel and, and win competitions. And, you know, we've won every available competition consistently, whether it's in cricket, football, netball, basketball, etc. So, you know, when, when you see that happening, you know, you must feel very happy. But, you know, there's still a long way to go. Um, I guess one thing that I'm perhaps a little bit sad about is that we were not able to introduce at the rate the type of technology that I would have liked to have introduced into the programs to ensure that um, those successes are even greater. But that's for someone else to do in the future. Well, before we give you your wristwatch and walking <laughs> chair, I grew up hearing that if the rain falls on St. Swithin's Day, it'll fall for 40 days after that. That's the 30th of November, our Independence Day. I also heard that when Barbados cricket is strong, West Indies cricket is strong. The BCA's AGM and general elections, I believe, are looming. Could you shed some light on whether you're still running for the presidency, as I have been misinformed and misunderstood about? Of course he's not running. <laughs> but yes, you can tell us a bit about But Martin, you, you have been misinformed. Um, yeah, I'm a current BCA member. Uh, I intend to run again um, for the board as a BCA member. I have no interest in the presidency uh, whatsoever. Um, I just really want to make a contribution to Barbados cricket. I was born in Barbados. I played for Barbados. I have come back here after spending 37 years in England. And I've made a contribution during that 15 year period since I've been here to Barbados cricket. And I want to continue to do that. Um, I've started a lot of work. I'm not finished yet. so. You know, I would like the, the members of the BCA to give me the opportunity to continue. And I'm sure people like yourselves, uh, Wayne and, 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 and Martin, will be only too happy to ensure that that happens. But, no, seriously, um, no, I, I really want, I, I'm a servant of Barbados cricket and West Indies cricket. And um, you, can you give us some background, though, as to, to, to what transpires with these, these, these upcoming elections? Well, basically, the elections, as you know, um, anybody can, uh, when I say anybody, I mean, you must be a member of the BCA before you can actually apply to be a member. So once you're a member of the BCA, a paid up member, that is, because anybody can be a member, but not paid up. But once you're a paid up member, um, you know, if you want to run, you can put your name forward and, and run for the BCA. All you have to do then is to, is to gather the support uh, from within the membership. Um, to, to, to help you um, on your way. And so really, this year I expect that there will be several other people running for the board, and, um, and that's a good thing. Okay, well, Roland, thank you for joining us here on Anything Cricket, Let's Talk. I'm going to in extend an invitation to you and our viewers to join us on Friday when we do a recording of the next episode of Anything Cricket, Let's Talk at the special location of Rascal's Restaurant on the Mighty Griner Highway, just there in Brandon's. Come join us, feel your questions. We'll be shooting from Rascal's on the Mighty Griner Highway.
Rascals Barbados. Let us serve you in a relaxed atmosphere with complimentary Wi-Fi or try a takeout meal. Rascals on the Mighty Griner Highway. Call 538-9990. In this segment of Anything Cricket, Let's Talk, Philip Hackett had the privilege of speaking with Cricket West Indies Vice President, Dr. Kishori Shalom. Dr. Shalom, you've been rather busy over the last few weeks. Um, I, I guess it has been a, a pretty busy time since uh, you have uh, accepted the new challenge. Tell us about it. Yeah, thanks, thanks Philip. Um, yeah, interesting time indeed. Um, we, we have been on the road. I mean, it started before the actual elections. President Skelet and myself, we, we have been truly carried on, you know, um, speaking out our policy. And then once elected, um, and I think March 26, the vote was, um, you know, we, we set out to actually start implementing those policies immediately. Mm -hmm. And so far, you know, the cooperation has been great, um, both from the general public and most importantly from the secretariat, you know, our staff there. And so what we're doing is really walking in you know, a holistic sort of approach mm -hmm. to improving our cricket. You know, um, obviously all it is. So I don't expect the fans to to actually see these things. Yet. You know, they're not actually you know, materializing as yet. But quite quite sure. Yeah, I, mean, I suspect that you know you will see some progress being made. What are your own thoughts on the team selection process up until this point? In other words, the system that you have come and that you found. Well, yeah, we always believe that, you know, um, the system had great deficiencies, you know, um, and hence, <laughs> in our plan, 10-point plan, as I'm sure you're aware, mm -hmm. um, there was that um, component to address, you know, evaluate our selection system. And I mean, I'm sure the public, in fact, we currently are um, in the process of conducting a survey mm -hmm. um, with fans. I think some 2,000 plus fans have responded so far to the survey questioning them about our selection system and their thoughts. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that have been revealed thus far is that the fans lack confidence in our selection system. You know? So it goes to show that we are in line in terms of what the fans are thinking. And you know, a critical process is to review our system, ensuring that it's in keeping with modern times. You know, I think we could safely say that our, our counterparts or international teams mm -hmm. have gone way ahead of us in terms of the actual selection system mm -hmm. ensuring that it's robust and transparent at the same time. So we, we are on our way, we have had about six meetings of our committee comprising of myself as you mentioned, Jimmy Adams is the director of cricket, Ina Lewis who you interviewed some time ago, yes. um, our chairman of cricket committee. Um, Robner Sawan as a past player, mm -hmm. um, your fellow native um, Phil Wallace yes. and uh, Miles Bascom, who was a former of West Indies, yes. uh, and he played for West Indies in the T20 game as well. So yes. he has that you know, um, experience as well. So uh, a, a, a nice unit, mm -hmm. and together we have set off, and, and the work is, is ongoing. Our completion, our um, proposed completion date is August 20th. Mm -hmm. um, then we'll present. There's a lot of work to be done in a short time. Yes, we have already started collecting data, so we have had some interviews as well with past West Indies players and administrators, a um, couple of selectors as well. And you know, it's a, it's a very comprehensive process that we are going through. You know, I'm quite excited about the whole exercise. Um, our deliverable, our ultimate deliverable, deliverable will be to produce a report with our selection policy, and that would be um, complemented by a short list of candidates to be considered for selections, to, for selectors, you know, in the early future. Is this a largely part of the problem? You said that people seem to lack confidence in the system. Is this a largely lurking there somewhere, you think? Did you take the interview, Philip? <laughs> because that is actually one of the questions asked in the interview. Okay. Um, you know, does fans, um, do the fans think that insularity exists in our system, and I could tell you that uh, majority, significant majority, said yes. Right. So we are obviously going to continue 
gathering data mm -hmm. and at the end of it we we'll analyze it and be able to you know final report be able to justify whatever we come up with whatever solution or uh, proposal we come up with. But the people who would say as long as we have the human element in it, it's gonna be near impossible to remove that that insularity. Well let's hope that it won't be visible. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, someone will be able to, and then the thing with selections, you know, is always that question mark because sometimes it's a touch and go between two players. Um, but, but what we want is that a, a selector, whether it's, a, it's the lead selector, you know, and I know it's, I'm trying not to say chairman of selector because we probably trying to move away from that term, you know, or that label for, you know, um, but whoever speaks on behalf of the selection panel. We are hoping that that person will at least be able to justify selection, you know, um, in terms of the communication to all stakeholders, right? Uh, whether to players, to fans, to administrators. And I think that will help us to understand, you know, decisions made and hopefully it can eliminate, you know, at least reduce whatever um, motion of our insularity is. More from Dr. Shallow when we come back. Anything Cricket, Let's Talk is brought to you by Rascals Barbados, My Kind of Beauty, and the Calvary Institute. Dr. Shadow, you have had interviews, as you pointed out, with a number of um, interest groups and, part, and individuals. Um, what has been coming out so far? But apart, apart from the insularity issue, what solutions have been offered? Well, the, the meeting with the past players, especially um, that, that has been really you know, fruitful. You know, we heard about communication issues. In fact, we, we met with about I think close to ten past players thus far, and I, I, I guarantee you that not one. You know, has said that they left West Indies cricket on a positive note. In fact, a couple were very frank in saying that had they been in the, had they been um, invited to such an exercise, you know, a couple of years ago, they would not even consider attending. You know, and so we believe that communication to our players over the years is something that we could definitely improve on. And you know, they're also in terms of providing feedback. You know, um, there has been suggestions in terms of the, the composition of the selection panel, whether there should be a, a separate panel for male, female, senior, junior level. You know, um, there's been other suggestions in terms of the, the criteria and qualities of a selector, you know, whether they should have international experience and so on. So the discussions have been extremely fruitful. And again, you know, um, within a few weeks, you should be able to, you know, um, compile these data, um, analyze them, and then present them in a, in a nice little proposal for a board of directors. Has any thought been given either by, by you, by your colleagues, or by any of the parties interviewed to the concept of having one selector? We may of course have scouts and other individuals doing a lot of the legwork, but basically one person with the responsibility for selection in a similar manner to what we have in, in some professional football entities. We're pretty much the manager of a big city. Yeah, it is, I mean, great deliberations have gone into this and continue to go into this exercise. And we are very open minded about the, the entire process. So at this stage, we are not, you know, eliminating any sort of idea. You know, whether it's one, two, three, four, five, you know, we, we, we really want to hear from the stakeholders before we decide, you know, which way we want to go. Now, you mentioned just now the issue of relationships with players and communication and so on. And just recently there's been some talk about a guy called Darren Salmon, who has indicated that, um, who has apparently indicated that he's available and ready for selection again, and maybe even at the leadership level. Is this something that will be coming from a discussion with, with the current administration, or is this just a player who is making himself available because of his interest in investing in cricket? Uh, I don't know who Darren would have had in, um, discussions with, you know, but what I'll say is that we believe that any player, any West Indian, you know, who believes that they still have a chance to make the team and once they make themselves available, 
you know, um, that they should be considered. Um, considered by the selectors based on form, fitness, you know, as it is for, for any other player. So if if Darren or Marlon Samuel or any other player, you know, um, believe that they still, you know, have within them what it takes to make the West Indies team and they are they are available, then they should be considered and the decision should be you know, based on cricket, you know, cricket and reasons only. So it's totally a decision to be made by our selectors. But as far as you're concerned, uh, you're also a cricket fan, obviously. So as a cricket fan, knowing what has gone on before, your natural response to, to, to that um, that statement from, from, from Darren Sandy, is it something that you think could be t- taken seriously? Or has his thing not? Well, again, that, that is why we put professionals in place. You know, that is why we, we hire selectors. That's why we have a director of cricket, and you know, I mean, as a as a fan, I don't think my opinion counts. You know, <laughs> um, what counts is actually the the selectors and the best composition of what it takes to to win matches and win series and, and tournaments. So, I mean, part of this whole selection exercise is to ensure that when we put a selection panel in place, mm-hmm. that their decision would be the best mm-hmm. and. Quite, quite frankly, I mean, selectors often look at many different factors that we as fans don't really consider. Okay. So I, I want to trust the panel, and in, in that, I believe that they will make the best decision based on the availability of all our players. Coming up to the discussion, though, your, your discussions with the task force and the various personalities, um, I, I'm going to get your response to this base on that interaction. And I don't think we've had too many discussions recently about team selection unless the issue of fitness as you said um, comes up and we saw Russell for example at the World Cup struggling with fitness Chris Gill has had his challenges as well and in fact um, Russell's World Cup ended prematurely. Come out of all of that there are those who are saying well if you want to take Russell to the World Cup knowing that he has his challenges and we're persisting with Chris Gill at 39 years old um, despite the fact that these players are obviously not fit why is a Cornwall? Um, why, why, why do the selectors continue to ignore him? So what I'm, what I'm saying to you, obviously you're not a selector, but is there anything that has like come up in the discussion and in the new policy going forward that will have some flexibility in terms of what really fitness is? What I can say is that there is actually a policy. So I mean, I've been on the board as a director for past for more than two years now. And I recall that we actually implemented a policy that says that though they are a fitness standard, the selectors, they have the, 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 the leeway mm-hmm. to select their best team in the event that one of these players or players do not meet the criteria in terms of the fitness criteria, mm-hmm. then they could actually make a special request mm-hmm. and an um, uh, argument for a player and it would board them when would decide whether you know to agree mm-hmm. whether to approve such selection or not mm-hmm. so there are cases where there can be ex- exceptions okay because it does seem to um, some people on the outside the average demon that you know um, it is unrealistic to expect a same, the same standard of fitness by the given test um, of a guy who may be excessively heavy um, you know in comparison to someone who is, is much lighter and especially so when the, the guy who may not pass those normal standards of fitness continues to outperform those who are supposedly fit. Yeah, and that's why we have, and I mean, we, we intend to engage professionals, um, medical experts, mm-hmm. to advise us on these things. And I think that is, that is a component that maybe we have not utilized enough in the past, you know, ensuring that our guys are screened and tested properly to know their capabilities or not. So what we're saying is that if a guy, based on his physical structure, mm-hmm. his physique can actually score 60 or 50 in a year test, then they should not be performing at 30, right? And these are things that only the medical experts can advise us on. And based on that, that selectors should make their decisions. We'll have more of Dr. Kishori Shallow Cricket West Indies Vice President here on Anything Cricket, let's talk. Rascals Barbados, let us serve you in a relaxed atmosphere with complimentary Wi-Fi or try a takeout meal. 
Rascals on the Mighty Griner Highway. Call 538-9990. That's our show, but remember, Friday, July the 26th, 7 o'clock, Rascals Barbados on Brandon's Beach on the Mighty Griner Highway. Join us for anything cricket. Let's talk. Enjoy the experience. Come and ask your questions, make your comments, and generally interact with the panelists. So, thanks for watching. Join us on Friday when we meet at Rascals Barbados.